Hi folks, in this video we're going to be talking about the Skydio 2 platform. The Skydio 2 is one of the first autonomous drones available on the market that is fully functional without user input. It's also one of the first autonomous systems really of any kind uh, that consumers can purchase at a reasonable price point and operate on their own without any kind of spe special certifications. This video is going to go into depth on three key things. The first is the trends in the drone industry that have led the word drone to become synonymous with this quad rotor form factor where most drones have either four propellers or sometimes six but uh, on most consumer models we see four. We're going to take a overall look at the hardware that is on the Skydio 2 specifically, uh, what they've got on there, talk a little bit about why they made some of the design decisions they did or at least theorize on why they did. Finally, we're also going to talk a little bit about the autonomy specific hardware on this platform. That's where this really shines. That what makes, that's what makes the Skydio special. Uh, we're going to talk about what extra pieces are necessary for these autonomous behaviors, as well as what we can learn from them and how they may impact autonomous drones moving into the future. A note that this video will be a little bit technical. I'm going to try my best to stay sort of at a conceptual level on a lot of the different things here, but drones are somewhat complex and really awesome devices. They've got a ton of crazy software happening under the hood. Again, first part of a multi-part series, we're going to dive as much as we can into the different hardware and software pieces that are necessary for an autonomous drone to exist. But if I'm being either too broad or, or being too technical at any point in time, please leave, a, please leave a comment below. If there's a technical concept that I mention and don't go into enough detail about but is interesting, please also leave a comment about that. I'm super open to make it, making other videos that are of concepts that are interesting to folks. With that, if this sort of thing seems interesting to you, please leave a like on the video. Please subscribe if this sort of content is interesting to you. And with that, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So to start, we're going to talk about the obvious really quick the quad rotor geometry. This is really what's taken over the drone market. Basically every consumer drone of any kind, whether it is a small DJI Mavic Mini, a larger platform like the Mavic Pro or the Skydio 2 that are sort of at similar size scales, even to larger devices are all quad rotors. We don't carry around small fixed wing airplanes in our backpack and we don't carry around small helicopters on our backpack and we don't have camera helicopters unfortunately. Uh, and there are a number of different factors that we can talk about that have led to this sort of trend and that's what we're going to go into depth next. Really there are three key things we need to think about. The first is mechanical complexity, the second is the ability to vertically take off and land, and the third is scale efficiencies in manufacturing. The first and third are somewhat related, but they're sort of broad enough that we need to separate them out to really understand how they play into the fact that, well, now we've got these. So as implied, quad rotors are quite simple, mechanically speaking. They operate with four brushless motors mounted directly to fixed wing propellers. A fixed wing propeller basically means that this pitch, the angle at which these propellers are mounted to the motors, is constant. This is important because helicopters actually do not have fixed wing rotors. The main rotor that you see is attached to a system called a swash plate which actually allows for this angle to be changed while flying and that is a main control system that allows for significant degrees of freedoms uh, of control in a helicopter. That kind of system, as it may sound, is also extremely complicated a and one of the key things to keep in mind here is at a small scale like this a system like that which has to be highly robust to a lot of different stresses in a lot of different directions would be extremely expensive to manufacture. Planes, while simpler than helicopters, have other complexities with them. Even though the uh, main thrusters themselves may be fixed wing propellers, you still need to have flaps, ailerons, and rudders in order to properly have full control over the aircraft. Still, with airplanes, our main issue comes with our second critical criteria, which is vertical takeoff and landing. This is something we all kind of already know, but planes require runways. There is technically a scale benefit where smaller fixed wing aircraft don't need quite the same size of runway relative to their lengths to take off and land, but it's still a pretty significant bottleneck to actually require that kind of space in order to take off and land. More so than take off, the ability to actually catch a quad rotor in your hand while landing in all sorts of different crazy situations on a rocky mountain, maybe even on a beach or maybe even on a boat, something that would be prohibitive with a fixed wing aircraft it, it, it is a pretty big plus and that's something that's really, uh, that's really uh, um, 
that's something that really supports both quad rotors and helicopters. Another thing to keep in mind about both planes and helicopters, this is not sort of a uh, main item in this video, but I just want to touch on it, is uh, piloting those things is not easy. Uh, it's not something that a beginner or, or somebody new to flying small scale aerial vehicles can just pick up and do. It takes practice, it takes time, and it's quite a complicated maneuver. Whereas when we look at the way that quad rotors work and some of the software and, and flight controllers we'll talk about in a second, they actually allow a lot of different novices to, to take to the skies without nearly as much uh, overhead work. Finally, we get to our third uh, item, which is the scale efficiency in manufacturing. These brushless motors that run these propellers uh, on quad rotors, they're all very similar in a lot of ways. They're all sort of at a similar size scale. They have seen a renaissance of sorts. Brushless motors in general have seen a renaissance of sorts. And it's now quite trivial to find really, really power dense motors that are, that are quite efficient and quite small. They're also not expensive at all and easy to come by. That kind of simplicity in the supply chain is critical as companies are trying to actually manufacture these at scale at a cost where consumers like you and me can actually purchase one. In addition to the motors themselves, the control electronics for brushless motors have also been continuously coming down in cost. Brushless motors use something called an ESC, an electronic speed controller, in order to actually regulate the amount of power going into the motor and subsequently the amount of torque and the RPM that the motor is running at. All of this being said, the word efficient is kind of a misnomer when it comes to quad rotors. As it stands, aerodynamically they're rather inefficient. In order to hover or stay at a somewhat constant altitude they need to be constantly exerting as much thrust as possible. Compare this to a fixed wing or glider aircraft where a not quite a hover but a very 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 close uh, uh, a constant altitude flight can be achieved with very 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 minimal amounts of power input. Again it is a glide and technically you are losing altitude but if you look at it over time, you can have glide factors of up to 0 0.8, 0 0.9. I mean, you can really, really achieve very efficient flights with gliders. Even helicopters are actually more efficient than quad rotors, even in a stable hover. Even they have to be constantly exerting thrust in order to maintain a constant altitude. But we need to pay attention to the size of the rotors slash propellers. One of the key things to keep in mind is the squared relationship between the length of the propeller to the volume of air displaced. So if we think about the air being displaced by this propeller as sort of a cylinder, the size of that cylinder increases by a factor squared compared to the diameter of the propellers. So when we have one large rotor, that is much more efficient than four small ones. This again leads us to one of the factors that I had mentioned earlier, which is controllability. Helicopters and airplanes can be flown by wire by manually controlling the different control surfaces. You can manually fly a helicopter by wire and you can manually fly an airplane uh, by controlling the manual control surfaces as well. With a quad rotor, if you try to fly by managing the thrusts of all four propellers simultaneously without any kind of reparameterization or any kind of intelligence, it would be extremely difficult. This leads us to one of the limitations of quad rotors, which is the fact that they all need some kind of intelligent flight computer. They all need to have a system on board which is able to take six degrees of freedom, six DOF commands, and actually turn them into thrusts for the different motors. This is not technically that complicated. I'm not going to go into detail on it in this video. It's just a whole lot of three-dimensional physics. Uh, it's not complicated. It's just sort of tedious uh, and, and, and it's very doable. Um, but essentially, we don't want to be flying saying, oh, this motor a little bit more, this motor a little bit less. We don't want to be thinking like that. We want to be thinking of forward, backward, uh, you know, pitch, and then uh, yaw, and then roll. We want to be thinking in three dimensions. And so in order for quad rotors to do that, there has to be that extra level of intelligence on board. Still, even though this is an extra electronic requir requirement, these kinds of electronics are cheap now. Like we mentioned with the ESCs before, things like this, while they add a layer of complexity, they don't really add a layer of cost. And that brings us back to our main point with this segment, which has sort of gone on for a little bit now, but all of it to say, even though quad rotors have a number of downsides as, they, as it comes to their sort of aerodynamic efficiency, even though they have some downsides in the sense that they have some extra complexities to think about, it all gets eaten up by the fact that in manufacturing, this is super, super simple to put together. These electronics are quite cheap, the propellers are quite cheap, uh, the, the brushless motors are quite cheap, it's all super simple. Again, this is a direct 
ma brushless motor mounted fixed wing propeller that's super easy to take on and off. Those simplicities pay back in spades when you're in the manufacturing process and is what allows somebody like me to buy a drone like this that's fully autonomous for a thousand bucks. This brings us to the Skydio 2 platform. Let's now take a second to talk about the three things that this drone has in addition to everything we've talked about before that actually allows it to perform autonomous camera behaviors. The first is an upgraded compute platform. This sits above the flight controller we talked about before and actually sends commands to that flight controller. We need some way to translate user inputs, say, follow this person or follow that car, to actual plans throughout 3D space that automatically avoid obstacles and maintain the view of your target in frame. It's no small task, and so we need a significant amount of compute horsepower on board to handle that. There is a ton of autonomy software that allows all of that to happen, and it's a literal industry's worth of development. We're really not going to talk about it in this video. I'm going to try and go into more depth on uh, on all of that stuff as much as I can, uh, basically with what's publicly available uh, and, and what I've experienced with the drone itself in the autonomy section uh, of this series. In order to feed that compute platform and all of that autonomy software, we need sensors. The Skydio 2 is chock full of really, really high-end navigation sensors that allow it to create really, really awesome 3D uh, representations of the world around it as it's planning uh, its way through 3D space. The final portion, and this is not strictly necessary for all autonomous drones, but is necessary for autonomous camera drone behaviors, uh, is, is a gimbal. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about the Skydio 2 gimbal as well as what makes it special uh, and, and talk about the things that they've done in order to actually have that enable them to have really great uh, autonomous camera behaviors. With that, I'm going to rattle through some of the specifications real quick. I've just got them all up over here. I'm just sort of going to point at them here, rattle them off there. That way we've got all of that out of the way. So the main sensor mounted on the gimbal is a Sony 12.3 megapixel CMOS uh, sensor. It's capable of 4K video at 60 FPS in HDR. It's got a 2.20 millimeter lens at a focal length of 2.8. Uh, it supports a 100 megabyte per second uh, bit rate as well as a ton of different color pro profiles. The dynamic range on this is fantastic at 13 stops. Guys, this is an amazing camera. Uh, I'll be talking about this later uh, and in other videos, but the main camera itself gets some really, really awesome shots. Going to autonomy, the main compute platform is an NVIDIA TX2 Tegra X2. Uh, we've got six nav cameras. I'll point them out in a second. Uh, we've got three on the top as well as three on the bottom. These are all 4K fisheye cameras. They're all uh, also Sony sensors. Between the two sets of fisheye cameras above and below that are I think either 180 degrees or more, it doesn't specifically say, uh, the drone is able to have full 360 degree visibility. They've also got on their spec sheet that this drone has nine onboard custom deep neural networks. Neural networks are sort of the main building block of artificial intelligence of today. We can go into more depth on that probably in a later video, but uh, suffice it to say, when the drone is doing something smart, it's either recognizing people or recognizing cars or, or really navigating its way through different things. It's all some kind of neural network. The gimbal itself has three axes. It's got roll, pitch, and yaw. This is a little bit special. A lot of gimbals only have two axes, uh, roll and pitch. Having the, the yaw normally handled by just the drone itself yawing in place, as opposed to the, whole, the gimbal yawing in addition to the drone. Uh, this is something we'll talk more about in a second, but also a real, real, really great move. The drone has quick release anti-noise uh, or low noise propellers. Uh, I don't know how low noise, low noise really is. Uh, I can sort of take a clip of taking the propeller on and off really quick. You know, it's super simple. Um, I won't say that it is a particularly quiet drone. It is still a drone and still quite loud, uh, but you know, uh, it, it's it's uh, supposed to be low noise propellers. On the back, we see a magnetically mounted uh, lithium polymer battery. This is a 48.79 watt hour battery. It's a three cell uh, 3S1 piece, so three in series, one in parallel LiPo battery at 11.4 volts. Down here, we can also see some Wi-Fi information. Uh, we can see the main contacts for that battery, and we can also see a micro SD card slot. Uh, these batteries are super handy. Uh, they turn on here and they've got little LED indicators. Uh, it's really easy to buy a couple of these. Um, 
by default when you purchase the drone the only way to charge the battery is through this USB-C pass-through it's also possible to use this pass-through to take a look at photos and and get diagnostic data off of the drone uh, um, and so they, they do sell another uh, charger on the website something I'll talk a little bit more about when we go to another video on the different interfaces so things like the beacon the controller the app things like that I'll also talk about all those other accessories there uh, but you know USB-C port Something else that I want to mention that's kind of interesting is you can actually see a fan grill right here. Uh, and so when the drone is running, uh, and I'm either taking video off of it or it's running and hasn't taken off yet and the props aren't running, you can actually feel the heat radiating out of here. It's, it's, it's quite a lot. Uh, and so normally when the props are running, you get, uh, I shouldn't say fan grill, it's really just an intake really. Uh, you, can, you can guess that the props are sending you know, air through there that's, a, that's cooling the uh, the onboard computer and the battery. If the drone is not running, this whole thing, this whole body gets quite hot. Uh, and overheating is actually something that I've had problems with where the drone performs significantly more poorly when in hot environments because the computer itself is heating up just so much. Something to note about this particular platform, uh, it's got the sort of stereotypical four-armed uh, design, uh, but the arms do not fold. This is something that's kind of common in other drones, like DJI drones in particular, they tend to fold. Uh, but with this particular model, at the time of release, Skydio mentioned that the relative positioning of these cameras, as well as on the other side, of course, uh, were extremely important and allowing for foldable arms would mess with that calibration. So the relative distance, relative positions of these cameras relative to each other, uh, as, as well as to the main sensor, of course. That being said, uh, more recently, Skydio has released the Enterprise X2. Uh, this drone does have foldable battery, uh, foldable arms, uh, and it still maintains the same tri-nocular camera setup. So clearly, they figured that problem out. Uh, it's just this platform has not been been updated to reflect that. Uh, though you know, it's not the not the biggest deal in the world because it is a quite small drone, physically speaking. A quick note on the onboard TX2. I do think it is a custom variant uh, of the of the Nvidia TX2. This is something I've used many times in the past at, pre at previous jobs as well as just in hobby projects. I'm very familiar. Uh, with the NVIDIA Jetson platform. This many 4K cameras is a lot of data. Six 4K nav cameras as well as a 4K60 main application sensor. That is an enormous amount of data to be flowing into a tiny little chip. Uh, and if I had to guess, it would be that the internal data links between these cameras and the compute is a MIPI CSI lane. MIPI CSI stands for some kind of mobile uh, camera serial interface. It's a much more robust data interface compared to USB or other things, uh, but the number of lanes available on a default TX2 I don't think are enough uh, to handle seven 4K cameras. Uh, unless they're doing some kind of selective polling where they don't actually pull everything at once, which is always possible, uh, they must have some kind of custom setup when it comes to that much data. Again, this is one of those moments where things got really technical for a second. If anything here deserves its own video or more detail, please leave a comment below. Taking a second to talk a little bit more about the gimbal. Uh, it is a three-axis gimbal uh, with a cute little remove for flight uh, thing there, uh, which is particularly unique. Again, normally drones have pitch and roll and not usually yaw. This was a great move by the Skydio folks because it gives a ton of flexibility for the drone to yaw more freely while planning autonomous behaviors and still being able to keep targets like people or cars or bikers or whatever uh, in frame and still continue to follow things like the rules of one third uh, uh, and to maintain good cinematic photography. It is a great gimbal. The main application sensor is a beautiful piece of camera hardware. It takes some of the best videos I've ever seen. The HDR makes videos at like the beach or something look gorgeous. Uh, really, this drone, I, I have a ton of ton of videos to show off about it. I hope this hardware overview was useful. I've got two more videos planned. One where I talk about the interfaces, which includes the app, which is a big one, that's the main interface, as well as some accessories like the Skydio beacon, the Skydio controller, uh, as well as some other knickknacks like the different accessories they sell for it. Another video I'm going to be uh, focusing on that I'm super excited for is a dive into some of the autonomy. I have been to some talks uh, by Skydio engineers. Like, there are some resources floating around, some public talks they've given on how sort of the autonomous behavior of this drone works. It's really exciting stuff. Those folks are on the bleeding edge of autonomous software, clearly, because even though this drone I bought in 2019 
Uh, it's been two years, even though a good portion of that was a certain uh, pandemic. Uh, they're still at the top of their game. I still get software updates. It's still one of the best autonomous systems money can buy. And that too, not, not a ton of money considering what you're getting for it. Um, so I hope this video was helpful. There's a bunch more coming. This drone also just features uh, quite a bit in all of my other, vid other videos. I use it a ton just to get, just as my main drone. Uh, so hopefully that sounds exciting. If you like this video, if you really made it this far, please take a second to hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Please leave a sub if this sort of thing is interesting to you. There's a ton of other videos coming, more about the Tesla, more about the Skydio. I'm going to be talking more about uh, some gimbals that I've got from DJI as well as my DJI drones, some electric go-karts, some electric scooters, like all sorts of crazy things, 3D printers, CNC machines, whatever you can imagine. Uh, so videos on all of that coming as well. The next few will likely be angel investments. Uh, including some other drone companies uh, that, that I've got some involvement with as well as some, uh, you know, future of home technology. So tons of interesting videos uh, are coming out. If that's interesting, please subscribe. Hope this was useful. Uh, thank you so much and see you in the next one.